should mute, mute my phone. Hey everybody, welcome to Soul Chats with Psychic Medium Danny Joe. I'm super excited to be here with an amazing guest, Michelle Cohen. And Michelle is from Iowa. And I, I'm going to have to think about this, how we met, but... Um, Facebook. Okay. Had to have been. Had to have yeah. been. Your soul chats. I became, I started watching them. Oh, funny. Okay. Well, we'll dive more into that whole story and how that all transpired and actually a cool little story I have from when I traveled to Florida. Oh, but that's right. Yes, I just wanted to show everyone this is the cover of your book, and we'll talk a little more about this here in a minute. But um, why don't you, Michelle, maybe tell everybody a little bit about you, uh, who you are, and where you're from? Okay. Um, as uh, Danny Joe said, I'm from Iowa. I grew up in southwest Iowa, and I was raised on a farm. We had dairy, cattle, and my dad was a farmer, uh, did crop farming, big family. There was uh, 11 children born to the family and um, there's nine of us still living. My parents are both gone. And I was number nine of the big group. So I'm one of the younger ones. And um, so my first husband, Joe, we met when he worked for the IRS, he was a federal agent, and I was a nurse at the American Red Cross. I worked on the blood mobiles. And Joe came in to give blood. And, um, you know, when I saw him walk in, I was just, it was like an old soul looking at an old soul that they knew. And I just knew he was supposed to be my husband. I just knew it. And after he left, I remember tell, telling the other gals, you know, there goes my husband. I just don't know how I'm going to meet him again. <laughs> but anyhow, we did cross paths with a little help from somebody. And uh, he proposed and we got married. And we had one daughter together. She is now 30. But when she was 15, um, her dad, my husband, was killed by a drunk driver in Nebraska. And the drunk driver was also killed in the car crash. So our grief was very raw, very hard because it was sudden and traumatic. And it was a negligent act by, you know, it was manslaughter. And so, and the, you know, I was thrust into the role of being a uh, only parent uh, raising a grieving teenager. And that was really hard. And she was the only child, which, made it a little bit harder because she didn't have a peer, you know, to like a sibling to go through it with. But anyway, um, so then uh, life went on and I started journaling like right away um, after Joe was killed because there were so many different things that were going on throughout this story. And you, it's all outlined in my book. Um, one thing I, I say to people is some of the emotions in the book are really raw and I could have not recreated them this far out. But anyway, so I had all my journaling and um, knew someday I would write a book. And so a few years ago, I started losing some vision in my right eye. And at the time, I kind of said to myself, what haven't you done in your life that you might need your vision for in case I lose it in the other eye? And I knew I always wanted to write that book. So I just decided it was time. And I didn't really know how to get started. Um, I'm a nurse by profession and I'm not really wouldn't consider myself a writer, to be honest with you. I knew I had a story to tell and I had journaled and I'd put it in a rough draft over the years. And so I saw a Facebook ad for the Okaboji Writers Retreat, which Danny is going to go to it this year, which I'm excited about. Yes. Anyway, that's in Okaboji, Iowa. It's where the lake, Okaboji Lake is. Um, 
And that's held every September. And that year I went, it was the inaugural year. It was the first time they ever had it. And so I went there without a lot of expectations, just hoping that I would find people there that maybe could guide me. And so I really did. It like sparked a fire in me. I left there so ready to like put my book into print. Um, but something else happened at that retreat that was, was really neat. Up to that point, I thought I had forgiven the drunk driver. And I met a young lady at the retreat. Her name is Carrie. And I write about it in my book. Carrie was a recovered alcoholic. And it was just a chance meeting in this group where we were talking about things. And I don't want to spoil the book for people if they're planning on reading it. But it put me on the path to find forgiveness in my heart, which was really a silver lining to writing the book because when we forgive others, it's really a gift we give ourselves. And I did not realize how my not forgiving her had really made me keep one foot in Joe's grave. And I had the other foot outside the grave trying to go forward in life. And I, I just kept getting pulled back and forth and back and forth with my grief. But, um, so anyway, uh, yeah, I wrote this book and I published it in March and I was an Amazon uh, number one best seller for a new author already right away. Um, books done very well. Um, so anyhow, um, yeah. thank you for inviting me on your podcast here. So I'm that so excited to have you here. I am. Um... So we do, I also, for those of our local people, I have the book in store. So we have a few copies left. Um, actually has our own little label on the back there. Um, so if you stop into the store or need one of these, we can get it for you, but we'll give you contact info too, to get that from Michelle or from Amazon or however you want to go about it. But I want to tell you, um, we met on Facebook and I don't remember the exact circumstances, but I think that we both kind of were finishing a book about the same time. Yeah, we, we messaged about it. Yes. And so um, I remember thinking how excited I was for you to for your book to come out and, you know, what that was going to be like for you, um, knowing, of course, that you had had a tragic experience, which um, I figured the book had brought you some closure with. It did. But I, I got your book and I took it with me to Florida, to the Hay House Convention. And um, I hadn't gotten to read it before that. And so I, I took it with me and I thought, I'm gonna get it finished on this trip. And, and I did, I actually sat down in the airport to read before I got on the plane. And I messaged you all of this. We had this conversation, yeah. but I, there's this gnat flying around my face. And I thought, this is so weird. I'm in the airport, where in the heck did a gnat come from? <laughs> I don't think anything of it. I sit down and I'm reading. And I'm not very far into the book. I think I was on the plane and I was like, oh my gosh, I won't give it away. But the gnat made so much sense to me from the book and the story. And I was like, okay, I can't believe this. So I don't really think too much of it. I thought cool synchronicity, right? But then I get to the event and I sit down and I'm talking to a lady at the first um, uh, speaking engagement. We're waiting for the speaker to come out and we start chatting and I, um, she said, my, my brother was killed by a drunk driver. And I said, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm actually reading this amazing book right now that this author wrote about losing her husband to a drunk driver. And when I pulled the book out, she goes, Michelle Cohen, that's weird. I have a friend named Michelle Cohen. And I was like, okay, I'm like, the synchronicities just keep coming, right? And so the funnier thing was that night I go back to my Airbnb and I'm laying in bed and this gnat flies into my face and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> and I'm laughing. I'm so tired. And then I can't see it. So I'm thinking maybe I dreamt that. Maybe I made it up. Maybe it was a fly. So I said to spirit, if that was really a gnat, you got to prove it to me. I want to see that gnat again. So I fall asleep, of course, hit the pillow out like a light. I get up in the morning. I walk into the bathroom and the gnat is floating in the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what in the world? 
When you were writing all that to me, I was not surprised. I just was not surprised. And I, I, I agree. I don't want to spoil it for those that want to read the book. Yes. But the Nat stories are really a good storyline in the book because other people are always involved with it. Yes. And I loved it. I loved that it was kind of uh, your husband's way of kind of getting my attention so that I would reach out and chat with you. But I loved it. He had um, the best sense of humor. He really did. He was a funny man. And so it just makes sense to me that, yeah, that'd be like him. Let's use a gnat. Yes, I love it. Well, the whole spirit world stuff. Um, can we get into that part now? Yes. Talk, talk about that. Okay. So I was raised Catholic and, you know, not supposed to be going to mediums, right? I mean, it's frowned upon. Yeah. And I was grieving so hard. I mean, I was really beside myself. Joe was my soulmate. I mean, I didn't know how to live without him, to be honest with you. And so I was just struggling really, really bad. And one day I got an email from a gal that worked with him. And she would check in with me every so often. Such a sweet gal. Deb is her name. She was always so good about sending me a message like when it was his birthday or like anniversary of his death or whatever, just checking in. Well, on this date, she sent me this email and she wrote like on the message, don't be upset or offended that I'm sending this to you, but I think you should go and look at the date. So I opened up the email and it was about a medium from Des Moines. His name is Robert Baca that he was going to be in Omaha for a weekend, like open reading. So you could sign, you could pay and go to a session, a private session. And it just so happened to be on my husband's birthday. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go because this is going to be cheaper than therapy. <laughs> but I was leery. I'm going to be real honest. I was leery. I didn't, didn't really, I, I wasn't sure what to make of it. So anyhow, I took the day off of work so that when I got there, I could, you know, I didn't know how I'd be affected by it, to be honest with you, because I, I still was grieving so hard. So I get there and I'm sitting outside uh, the building and in my head, I'm like having this prayer session with God and I'm asking for forgiveness for being there because you know, okay, I know I'm not supposed to be here, but I don't know what else to do. My grief is so bad. Just please forgive me. So I go inside and I don't outwardly wear like a crucifix or anything. I used to, but I lost the crucifix and that actually was in the reading. I think I got a gnat flying. Oh my God. <laughs> Anyway, so um, go to the reading and I'm sitting on the couch and I'm watching people. I was there early watching people come, go in and come out. And he had one person right after another. And I was thinking to myself, well, if he if he's like trying to pull one over somebody, he's got to have a really good memory to memorize everything because there's no breaks in between these people. They're going in and coming out. Yeah. So I get in the room. And he sits kind of knee to knee to me in a chair. And so me being skeptical, I was looking all over the walls to see if there was any post-it notes about me. And there wasn't. And all of a sudden he closes his eyes. He does this reading with his eyes closed. And he first asked me um, if I was mad at God. And I said, no, I'm, I'm not mad at God. I don't understand why you're asking me that. And he goes, well, Joe is here. And he said to tell you that God's not mad at you for being here as if they could read my head when I was out, you know, my thoughts when I was in the car before I went in. But anyway, so many things came through in that reading. Um, it was stuff that came through about a vacation that we had years before and it was just joe and i and our two-year-old daughter and it had to do about my crucifix necklace that i used to wear all the time it was special to me and 
I was holding my, we were feeding ducks at a pond in Oklahoma. We were in Oklahoma City visiting his brother. We were feeding the ducks. And my daughter, who was two at the time, pulled on my necklace. And the crucifix went flying in some long grass. And I was so upset about it, I couldn't find it. So Joe had us stay there. And he went and rented a metal detector and came back and tried and tried and tried to find that crucifix. And he never did. But nobody knew that story. It was just me and Joe. And by God, that came through the reading. And Joe wow. told me not to worry about it, that he had the carbon copy and he was going to put it on me when I crossed over because he would be the first person I would see. So that put me on a path of healing. It was that reading did something for me. It made my faith stronger. And I'm going to tell you why. Joe was agnostic. It wasn't that he didn't believe or disbelieve. He just had a really hard time. He would go to church with us and he was baptized, you know, as a child in a different faith, but he just had a hard time believing. And one of the things that came through in the reading, um, when, when he was alive, he had a hard time admitting when he was wrong. He just, that was just his personality. And we would kid him about it. And it was such a topic of discussion in our little family that even at the wake and funeral, my daughter talked about it. She told everybody about how he couldn't admit when he was wrong. <laughs> and so the reading, Robert Baca said to me, Joe, said, you know how hard it was for him to admit when he was wrong. And he is telling me that he was wrong and you were right. And I said, well, what was I wrong about? And all he said was God, because I believed in, and Joe didn't. I used to always tell Joe, you know, there's a God and whatever. So I knew at that point with all those little things adding up, I just knew it was Joe. I knew it was. And then after that, I just had so many experiences, things that happened in our home in front of other people. And I, I talk about all these experiences in my book. Mm -hmm. And the reason I decided to share it all, and I knew I was kind of taking a risk at writing about it, especially being of the Catholic faith. I knew it was a risk to share my story, but I also knew that it helped me heal so much and that maybe there's somebody else out there that's struggling. And if I can bring a piece of hope to somebody, then it's worth it. Absolutely. And, and you know what I say? Um, I say bravo to you for really truly being able to stand in that because there is a lot of opportunity for you to get pushback and you know that and you were brave enough to do it anyway and I feel like when we're able to do that so that we can allow people to be more open-minded and choose for themselves and decide what's going to work for them I feel like we create change in the world that's for the good well I look at it like this Many people are born with gifts. They're mm -hmm. God-given gifts. We have people that can sing. We have people that can write poetry. We have engineers that are so smart that they can create things and do things in the world to make the world a better place. Scientists and not everybody has the same gifts, but I do believe there are gifts given to messengers and and it is working on behalf of a higher power. Now, I, I know there's people out there that probably take advantage of grieving people. Absolutely. And that's unfortunate. Because to take advantage of a grieving person is pretty low. But if a person um, can move forward in their grief journey by going to somebody like that, and their faith isn't, my faith is stronger than ever. That's what I don't get is because of that message about God, it, my faith is way stronger than it ever was. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I um, I had a client the other day. Uh, I wanted to add too, like every profession has good and bad people in it. Right, right, right. right. So, you know, there's, 
there's reasons to just pay attention to that. But I had a client come the other day and he sat down and I said, do you have any questions before we get started? And he said, well, I do have a question for you. He said, I'm Christian and I'm really worried about this, how this falls into my uh, belief system and, and faith. And so I told him that, you know, I'm actually an ordained minister and a Christian too. And, um, you know, talked about how um, that I would keep us protected. He was worried about what it would open him up to and that I, I wanted him to just have his experience and then he could decide for himself if it was best for him. And he was the sweetest guy. He um, had lost his wife. And when we were done, he said, I want to book another session right away. <laughs> And I said, well, I'm guessing that you felt like it was uh, it within your Christian belief systems to be comfortable with it. And and I get it. My husband's Catholic. And when I knew that I was a medium, we had been married almost 18 years already. <clears throat> Talk about a struggle. Right. But I think, um, you know, everybody has the right to choose what's best for them. And I think there's so much. And that's what my husband said to me. He said, when I saw how much healing people get from their time with you, how could I not support that? Right. You know, um, I don't think anybody should pass judgment on anybody that's grieving because you just don't know what they're going through. Ugh. And I will, I will say this. Um, I can't imagine losing a child, never lost a child. Hope I never lose a child, but I watched my mom, she lost two children. I watched my mother-in-law lose my husband, as well as friends that have very young children. That's got to be the worst grief that there's probably ever was, right? Because you lose your future. Yeah. And you, you know, your children are your future. Spousal grief is very unique. And I'm sure you've probably encountered widowed people and have heard, but you lose so much in one person, your partner, your lover, your best friend, financial, parenting, everything, your home. So many widows lose their homes after they lose their spouse. Just so, so much yeah. is affected by it. And because there's all these secondary losses with the initial loss of the spouse, that grief is so heavy and so complicated. It's hard to make it through it. And if somebody is passing judgment on somebody that has lost their spouse, shame on them. Because if they've never felt it, they have no idea what it's like. Yeah. Same with, I think, parents losing children. We just don't know. You know, we, we expect to lose our parents, you know, most likely. We will all probably lose siblings before us. But those two kinds of losses are so unique. And um, if seeking mediumship, if that person feels like it's the best thing for them, who, who am I to judge? Who is anybody to judge that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if you can see comments. We've ha had a lot of hello. No, I haven't seen any comments. Yes. And uh, loving this discussion. Thank us both, she says. And then Judy said, you're 100% right about losing a spouse. We have a few watching who have lost spouses. So they understand that position. Um, hey, if any of you uh, that are watching have any questions, feel free to pop them in there and we'll catch them uh, as we go here. Um, and Amanda said she was meant to hear this tonight. So many things are striking a chord. She is also a nurse. So probably connects to that too. Um, and wanna... you, you know, I was a hospice nurse. You were? So, yeah. At one point, I, um, I did witness some very interesting things. Very, very, very interesting things. Yeah. And I, I think we need to normalize some of this. I really do because um, grief is not talked about and, um, you know, I think you're right. People need to have a little bit more of an open mind and sometimes traditional therapy is cut it for some people. Right. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, I've actually had people tell me that, that, 
their sessions with me, do more for them than therapy. And I'm not downing therapy at all because I have some great clients and friends who are therapists and I've had therapy myself. Yeah. But I think, you know, everybody's, you know, I always say this, Tylenol doesn't work for everybody. Ibuprofen doesn't work for everybody. you got to research and do what works for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and maybe, you know, I, I, w- I want to talk about my book for just a little bit. Yes, so, yes. so, and that was one, one time that I did reach out to you too, when I was writing my book. So I had a beta reader read my book as a journalist, been a journalist for years, a male. And this, I think he's probably in his seventies. Anyway, he came back to me and he, he said, you have a terrific story, which I felt really good about that coming from somebody who was as qualified to read something as he was, plus being of the opposite sex, a little older than me. I wasn't sure how he would take my story. Sure. Um, But he had a suggestion. He goes, I know a lot of people will go seek a reading with mediums, but what about having like a therapist uh, write something for your book? So I reached out to you because on one of your podcasts, I had listened to, oh, I can't think of her name right now. And she's in my book. Stephanie. Stephanie. Yeah, that's right. Stephanie and then Sarah too. And they both wrote from the position of therapeutic counseling. Mm. And it was really good. I mean, yeah, I was so appreciative of that input. And I was so glad that he had made that suggestion because it just gave everybody another angle to think about it. So I, I loved that part. It's right at the beginning of your book. And I, I loved that part. Isn't it at the beginning? No, it's at the end. It's towards oh, the, the end. end. Mm-hmm. I um I must have read it first then because I remember reading it before I read the story, which is kind of funny. But I think because I know both of them. Yeah, yeah. Their um their words, but um and they've both been on your live, so yes. people will recognize them. Yes, yes, they have both been on the podcast and both uh good friends of mine actually. They um no, I wanted you to tell us also though about your book just for a different perspective of how did you find the book writing process and all the things that went along with that? Because I know along the way you ended up learning about social media and podcasts and all these different things. Yeah. I've, I'm actually started a podcast of my own yes. with my friend, Angie. Um, and I'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. So I, I had a writing coach who helped guide me with my writing that I had already prepared And then um, from that, uh, I got connected with a book manager. Her name's Stephanie Kroll. She was with My Word Publishing, and she actually has her own business now, um, Riley and and Infinity, I think it's called. Anyway, um, she guided me through the whole to self-publish. And I'm going to tell you why I self-published. You know, a person can go the route of traditional publishing where you – you know, go with a big publisher and send your book in with a proposal and see if they'll like do it. But you lose control of your book. Right. And I had talked to one person about it. And that person said to me, well, you can't have all that in one book. You see my book for the listeners. It's about death and grief and widowhood and raising a teenager through that. But it's more than that. My daughter wanted to change uh, the laws in Nebraska. And so we worked with former Husker, Huskers football coach, Tom Osborne, um, and he was a U.S. congressman, for her to draft a bill. And we tried to get this bill put into legislature in Nebraska. So I talk about all the pitfalls that we ran into with that. And then all about the after death communication, the mediumship, all of that stuff. So there was a lot of different moving parts, but they all happened in the course of several years. And I couldn't chop my life up. It was like all or nothing to me. I couldn't tell my story without telling the whole story. And so that's at that moment, I decided, no, I'm going to self-publish. I'm not going to do traditional. I want control of my book. I don't want somebody to tell me I can't put something in my book that I don't want taken out. And so that's what Stephanie did. She helped me 
uh, with all the ins and outs of self-publishing. And then she helped me connect with a lady who created the cover of my book. That's just beautiful. Mm -hmm. And there's a story. I'm going to share this story. Her name is Victoria Wolf. And this is a good story. Talk about synchronicities. Okay. So I never met, I've never met Victoria. And Stephanie said, well, I think you should go with Victoria. She's really good. And I said, that's fine. I trust you, whatever. So she said, I'll send her your manuscript. She'll look at it. And then she'll, she'll call you and you guys will figure out what the cover will look like. And so the day that Victoria called me, never met her, never talked to her before that. She calls me and she says, before we get started, I need to tell you a little story. And I said, okay. And she said that her and her husband live in an RV and they chase like 70 de degree weather. So they just travel around the United States. And at one point they were in Council Bluffs, Iowa, which is where we lived when my husband was killed. So mm -hmm. That is in the storyline. Now, when my daughter did all that legislature work in Nebraska, she was in the news, like all over um, in other states because she was a teenager trying to like make the roads safer from drunk driving. Anyhow, so for some reason, Victoria happened to be staying with her husband in their RV in Council Bluffs several years ago. And she was browsing on the internet about Council Bluffs and somehow stumbled across our story and read it and remembered it. And then when she got my manuscript, she, she started reading it and she realized I was the lady that she had read about on the internet. Now, what are the odds of that? Wow. I mean, so many God winks throughout this whole process. I can't even tell you how many. I wish I could have shared them all in the book, but they had to cut about 10,000 words out of my book in the process of making it more like condensed. But so here, here's a few, I just want to share a few more synchronicities because they are interesting and they're not in the book. So your listeners are getting a treat here. So one thing um, that the medium, when I went to the medium, okay. So I know I'm not the only grieving person out there that talks to their dead loved one when they're by themselves. I'm surely, I'm sure I'm not. I'm sure somebody out there does. So I used to tell Joe all the time, just let me see you one more time. You know, my friend's daughter, who was 15 at the time, when she lost her dad, she could see him in the house. Mm -hmm. And I would say, well, Sam can see Gary. Then let me see you one last time. I won't be scared. I would beg you. So when I get to the Robert Baca, he says to me, Okay, so Joe's telling me that he hears you begging him to show himself to you. But you don't have that gift. You have the gift of knowing when he's around. And I tell a story in the book about the time that we had three cats. And I was in bed. I had gotten my daughter up for school and she was getting dressed. And I was still in bed. This story's in the book. I was still in bed and I was watching TV and I felt the bed depress. And I thought it was our cat. We had three adult cats, right? And so I didn't think much of it. I thought cat was on the bed. I kept watching the news and then I felt it again. And I look behind me and there's no cats. And I thought that was so weird. And so, but then all of a sudden I could feel his energy. And I yelled at my daughter. I said, Come here. So she comes, you know, she's 16. She comes in there and she's like, what mom? And I said, I think your dad is here, but before, can you tell me where the cats are? Thinking that maybe they had just gotten off the bed. So she went looking for the cats. She came back in the room and she said, they're all sleeping on the couch because you already fed them. They're all sleeping. I said, then that is your dad. I feel your dad. And at that time, because I felt the bed depressed twice. When I went to see Robert Baca, that came through in the reading. When he said, your gift is not, you can't see anything because it's not your gift, but you have the gift of knowing 
just like when you felt the cats depress the bed. Amazing. It, I have had, I feel so fortunate that I've had all these blessings. To me, they're blessings. Yeah. Because it's what helped me propel forward with my grief. Absolutely. I think that, you know, the funny thing is too, I think a lot of times people miss their signs and this is a kind of a cute story. So my mom has been gone since 2021 and my sister uh, always says, oh, you always get, mom always gives you signs. I never get signs. Right. And I said, you're just missing them. So we're on the phone one day and we're talking and she goes, hold on, hold on. And she comes back and I said, what are you doing? And she said, well, the TV just turned itself on. I had to turn it down. And I said, you know who turned the TV on, right? And she's like, no. I said, well, is there anybody there with you? And she's like, no. Mom turned the TV on, silly. Like your TV didn't just come on by itself. And she's like, oh my gosh. Like, and I feel like something of that. Yes, it was so perfect. But sometimes, you know, I, I used to like not want to share my stories yeah. because you always fear that people are going to think you're crazy. Yeah. But you know what? I don't care if they think I am because it's what happened. I'm just telling it as it unfolds. And a lot of my stories have to do with other people like Victoria. And then, um, yeah, there's just so many synchronicities and really it's a oh, awesome. blessing. It's so awesome. And I think everybody gets them and not everybody catches them. Exactly. You have to be tuned it. into it. Yeah. So Pam said this was a God wink for her being able to catch this. And Great. Judy said, you're not for sure. This was back when we were talking about your husband. She said, saw my husband all the time and also know when he's around and watching. So great yeah. little synchronicities and connections. So I want to just share with everybody too. Um, so the book is called Better Not Bitter and it's available on Amazon, which Brooke will put up the links and everything tomorrow. Um, we do have it in the Sacred Soul store if you're local. And I know that if you reach out to Michelle or want to connect with her, um, she probably also has copies if you're local to her or want her to sign the copy and ship it. Um, tell everybody how to reach out to you. Okay. Um, my uh, website is author Michelle Cowan, M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E-C-O-W-A-N. Um, there's also author Michelle Cowan Facebook page. And... Um, started a podcast with my friend Angie. Um, I was actually asked to do a podcast for success in Iowa. And that's a good one. If somebody wants to go listen to it, it's episode 17. The guy that I did the podcast with, very interesting guy. And we actually interviewed him on our podcast. But he suggested after we talked, he's like, Michelle, you're kind of a natural at this. You should do a podcast. And I thought about it. And I talked to my friend Angie Hansen who talk about a warrior for grief. Um, she lost her son, her husband and her brother and her sister-in-law all in a short period of time. We decided to start the podcast. We don't make any money off of it or anything. It's just something that we believe in trying to help other people. And so we um, are interviewing what we like to call as warriors, uh, people that have had a loss, whether it's through death or divorce or separation or children won't talk to you, parents won't talk to you, or death of a pet, chronic illness, addictions, loss of a job, whatever the struggle is. And then how you found your light. So we titled the podcast From Loss to Light. And um, if you find it, it's got the yellow, like uh, sunflower and butterflies on it. So we just started it. We're still in our infancy with it. We've had, I think, five episodes maybe. So the first couple, I interview Angie and Angie interviews uh, me. And so you hear a little bit more about our stories. But we have got some great people coming up, like totally great stories coming up. We're booked out into next year already just because Wonderful. there's so many people that have found their light 
And maybe if we shine the light on them, somebody who's hurting will hear something that will resonate with them and help them. And that's what it's all about. Good karma out in the universe. Yes, I love that. I love that. I love that. I just had another little epiphany. Okay. Um, you said sunflowers and butterflies. And I obviously I see the sunflower on your book, but my dad comes as a sunflower and my mom comes as a butterfly. And I'm like, here's another synchronicity for us, right? Um, well, so and the sunflower for me, you'll read about it in the epilogue. Um, for the listeners, I am remarried. Uh, I've been, I just celebrated my ninth anniversary with my second husband, Steve, such a good man. He is not um, threatened at all about my first husband, which really makes us a good fit because I keep my first husband's spirit alive because we shared a daughter and I want her to feel her dad and everybody else that loved him. But anyway, um, even Joe was part of that. And it's, I don't want to spoil the story because this is in the epilogue, but that even comes through in the medium reading with Robert Baca. So incredible. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I have so many God wings. It's just been wonderful. Cool. Well, I apologize. I pronounced your last name wrong. I should have asked you. I always do that. Cow wing, just cow. like a cow. But for those of you that want to get her book, um, if you're local, come in. Otherwise, Amazon or reach out to her through her website. And then the podcast, where do they find that? Spotify. Spotify. Yeah. Um, and it's From Lost to Light. And yeah. you can catch up. We'll be dropping. We drop a, an episode every other Wednesday. So we just started in July. We we are well over 500 downloads already. Wonderful. And we've only just started, but we're just casting a wide net because the people that we're interviewing are like very interesting people that people want to hear their stories. So that's amazing. Listen, we'd love to have you. Yeah. Wonderful. So thank you. I just really want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing a little bit of your story. I think, um, and if anybody out there is thinking about writing a book, send me, get a hold of me through Danny or something. I'll share the information about the journey of how I got my story onto paper. And Perfect. I'm actually working on an audio book. I have an actress that has offered to narrate my book. Wonderful. That's so exciting. I'm exciting about that. Gosh. Well, seriously, though, um, all of you really need to read this story. It's a phenomenal story. Uh, regardless of what your situation is, I think it's a, a wonderful perspective and truly great things happening uh, because of it. Um, and I'm really excited to see you here. Yeah, in a couple, couple weeks. weeks. Yes, I get to meet Michelle at the Writers Retreat in Okaboji. Um, and for all of you that tuned in tonight, thank you so much for being here to support us. And if you're watching or listening to the replay, um, again, reach out to author Michelle Cowan.com or her Facebook page, and um, we'll see you all soon. But thank you so much for supporting Andy us. Joe, thank you for having me. And I just wanted to just end with this. Um, not all is good, but good can come from all. So I love that. Choose better, be better. I love that. What a wonderful message. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye.